in this lecture, we'll be going over irritable bowel syndrome, or IBS. IBS is a condition that involves abdominal pain or discomfort that occurs in association with altered bowel habits over a period of three months. This definition is already telling us things that we should do in our nutrition assessment. For example, we need to be asking about the patient's history, including their regular bowel habits, because this condition requires an alteration in the bowel habits. Also, um, it's important to be checking patient history because to qualify for the diagnosis, it has to be occurring for at least three months. So if it was just for one weekend, maybe, then this would not be a proper diagnosis. We also need to pay attention to the chief complaints for the symptoms of the pain or discomfort um, in the abdominal region. Now there are three subtypes of IBS. D for diarrhea, C stands for constipation, so the definition here is for altered bowel habits. So either increased or decreased in bowel movement frequency can be considered as altered bowel habits. Therefore, both diarrhea and constipation or a mixture of both can qualify as IBS. And this condition affects about 10% of um, the population in North America. So it's a relatively common condition. Historically, IBS was considered to be a functional disorder. But in recent years, as we learned more about how the hormonal and nervous systems regulate and interact with the GI tract, we came to realize that it is more than just a functional disorder. Sometimes there are other GI conditions, for example, lactose maldigestion or celiac disease that could lead to IBS. More importantly, we have recognized the importance of the GI tract and our nervous system and different hormones in regulating GI function, including bowel movement. Also, we have recognized that the interaction of the GI tract and the environment. So here for environment, we mean not only where the individual person functions, but also we are talking about their internal environment. For example, um, their gut flora, so the colon bacteria. This would be the environment in our intestinal cells um, that they have to deal with within our body. So this, of course, could affect bowel movement as well. The pathophysiology of IBS is still not very well understood. Uh, by definition, as we just discussed, there has to be some abnormal motility. So either that increased or decreased frequency. So this indicates that the intestines are not working properly. And of course, this contributes to the various symptoms that the patient complains about. Also, this abnormal motility may be the result of hormonal imbalance. We just mentioned that our intestines are under the regulation of the nervous system and also many hormones. So some of the hormones are produced locally because we know we have those gut hormones. And others are secreted by tissues or organs outside of the GI tract. We also mentioned the importance of the communication and interaction between the brain and gut. So we may have increased sensitivity to the stimulation of the GI tract, as mentioned right here. So then there is um, 
small intestinal bacteria overgrowth. So this could be where something is obviously not right. The colon um, is where the bacteria should be. And if we are having bacteria going up into the small intestine, this is problematic and could trigger many unpleasant symptoms. Then of course, the um, increased permeability of the mucosa. This could allow things to penetrate deeper into the walls of the intestine and of course, cause problems. For clinical manifestations, uh, we have the abdominal pain, change in bowel movements. So um, by definition of IBS, those two things have to be there. Also, there may be flatulence, which can also cause discomfort. And although this is a lower GI disease, sometimes patients complain of upper GI symptoms as well, such as reflux. So that is not uncommon. Also, uh, some people may complain of chest pain. So when a patient with GI symptoms also complains about chest pain, we need to rule out actual cardiac events because we know that conditions like heart attack, angina, could cause chest pain. Although we know IBS patients can have chest pain, we don't want to just dismiss chest pain as a symptom of the GI tract rather than an actual cardiac event we would still need to do tests to rule it out. So things such as an EKG or um, a cardiac enzyme test with blood samples. So again, we don't wanna just assume it's related to uh, the GI symptoms. We need to rule out the actual um, cardiac event. The medical treatment of IBS is guided by its symptoms. We can use antidiarrheal agents, uh, and we can use other medications that are not over-the-counter, like antidepressants and serotonin receptor inhibitors. So usually you'll see antidepressants used when a major symptom of IBS is diarrhea, and the serotonin receptor inhibitors are commonly used um, for when the symptoms are mainly constipation. The book talks about several medications that are either strictly, um, that are under uh, strict prescription control and uh, used for compassionate use only. So compassionate use, also called expanded access, refers to the use of certain medications for things that are not yet approved by the FDA. So for example, if a patient's treatment has run out of options, so they've tried all of the approved medication but nothing has worked, in that case, we could use medication that has not been approved. However, this does require a lot of regulation, there's paperwork involved, um, but it is possible and when people refer to expanded access or compassionate use, this is what they're referring to. So of course, again, the treatment is guided by the symptoms. So if we're talking about D-type or C-type IBS, um, we can use bulking agents or a laxative to deal with constipation or diarrhea, depending on which one it is. We can also use um, cognitive behavioral therapies because we can partially, although not completely, but we can partially control our, blood, our bowel movements and there are certain things we can do to control stimuli. So the cognitive behavioral therapies deals a lot with um, stress reduction and controlling fear or anxiety. And of course, it's done um, with a properly um, certified therapist. For nutrition therapy, 
um, alternating between constipation and diarrhea could lead to the nutrient deficiency and unintentional weight loss and malnutrition. So these are things that we need to be thinking of and be concerned with. So the problems for the nutrition diagnosis can include inadequate intake, altered GI function, undesirable food choices, and knowledge deficit, as well as disordered eating pattern. Um, a couple years ago, the magazine Today's Dietitian had a very interesting article um, that talked about how um, disordered eating, uh, many of the patients with disordered eating ended up showing symptoms of IBS and kind of talking about how the two can be interrelated. The intervention depends on the symptoms and the food triggers. So similar to the medical treatment, which is guided by the symptoms, so is the nutrition intervention. For food triggers, the patient obviously needs to be paying attention to what they eat and drink and then identify the foods, food groups, or be beverages that trigger these symptoms. So this is similar to what we saw for the GERD intervention. And um, now we're seeing it in IBS and we'll also be seeing it for some other GI conditions. The patient needs to be educated on monitoring what they are consuming so that once identified, these trigger foods can be eliminated from their diet. Also, in recent years, there has been a new approach called the, um, the FODMAP approach. So this refers to fermentable oligulo dye and monosaccharides and polyols. And these are referring to certain food items that contain these compounds that fall into these categories. Studies indicate that low FODMAP diets may help relieve symptoms. And on our next slide, we'll go into why that is. So the foods associated with the FODMAP components are ones that are um, not usually easily digested. They are highly fermentable. Therefore, high FODMAP diets contribute to a high osmotic load and fermentation. So these two things lead to the increase of pressure in the lumen. Therefore, we will have the luminal distension and gas production. And this leads to the symptoms we discussed, the gas, abdominal pain, and other types of discomfort. This figure is showing that if we have intake of a FODMAP food, um, it's showing what factors could lead to suboptimal digestion and absorption of the food. Uh, the factors can come from the lower end, um, from absorption or interaction um, with gut bacteria. Um, and remember the gut bacteria is responsible for the fermentation process. And we also have what our whole body is experiencing um, as a whole unit. So what our nervous system, our central nervous system is going through as well. We mentioned stress and anxiety, and it is very common for people when they are under stress, whether it's from work or maybe family, they may start to have altered bowel habits. Um, and, you know, this is because of the stress and anxiety associated with the IBS uh, triggers changes in the neurotransmitters and also hormonal changes. Therefore, we can have consequences in the GI tract. The good news is that in many cases, once the stressor or stressors are removed, then the GI symptoms will resolve on their own. So again, um, here, remember what FODMAP stands for and um, why they can cause those symptoms we see in IBS.
So here are some recommendations related to the low FODMAP diet. There are foods recommended, foods not recommended. Uh, so please study this table in detail on your own. Another important nutrition intervention for IBS is fiber. So um, insoluble fiber we know may exacerbate the symptoms. So insoluble fiber are those bulking agents and if we remember it leads to certain GI symptoms. But what we want to have and prescribe is um, psyllium. And this fiber you uh, may have come across when studying cardiovascular disease. It's a fiber that has been studied a lot and it's actually known to lower cholesterol. And of course, whenever we prescribe increased fiber intake, our fluid intake needs to be adequate. Um, often it also needs to be increased. Otherwise we'll get um, more unpleasant symptoms. The use of probiotics to manage IBS is currently under research. Um, it is promising, but we don't yet have solid evidence to make standard recommendations yet. If we think about it in theory, it makes sense, and over time, um, we will have more evidence available and hopefully be able to come up with some recommendations. We also need to be reducing gas, producing foods, and when the... Um, because gas, of course, could be the source of some of the symptoms. So again, uh, reducing certain foods. Um, and also when the patient eats, we need to educate them about um, avoiding swallowing gas in the form of air. So this table over here um, lists foods that are associated with gas production. And the well-known ones that are the cause of gas are, of course, the broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, and cauliflower. Um, and also over here, beans, um, this whole category is associated with gas production. And of course, this is something we need to know because our patients may ask for us to provide a list of um, food items that they should be avoiding because they cause gas. Here are some other steps to decrease gas production. We already discussed the food associated with this that we would need to decrease the intake of. For eating tips, in addition to the foods that we mentioned, fried and higher fat foods, so how the food is prepared also matters. These would be things that we might need to limit or um, avoid. We can also have smaller, more frequent meals. And from a behavioral st therapy stance, we would want to try and have mindful eating. So relax and eat rather than eating while we're anxious, upset, or on the run. So if we're in a hurry, maybe trying to eat real quick in between classes. And this can be difficult to do but we have to know that if we associate these anxious, upset, hurried events with eating, it could actually exacerbate gas production along with causing other symptoms of IBS. And we need to know to avoid carbonated beverages as well. For personal habits, physical activity is a good thing to help regulate our GI function especially for people with constipation. If they are able to increase their physical activity, it should help them out a lot. There are also some medications that can have side effects like constipation or diarrhea. So these would need to be things that we should consider as well. 